chapter number four. Is that where you're at right now? We're going to start reading, if you would please, in verse number seven, and we're going to go all the way down to verse number 21. All right, first John chapter four, and look down, if you would, at verse number seven. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. I want to speak to you. This is the subject of revival. This is part number four. So three Sundays ago, we preached the first in a series on the subject of, of revival. And boy, we need revival in our hearts and in our country. I mean, we desperately do. So this is revival part number four, and the title of my sermon is The Revival We Need. The Revival We Need. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for allowing us to be here today. Help us to honor you to please you, to worship you, to praise your name with everything that we do at church this morning. And I pray, Lord, right now, Holy Spirit of God, I yield myself to you. Please help me to have your power. I also ask you, Lord, for the mind of Christ. Help me to say exactly what you once said. And I pray for every person here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. If there's anybody who steps foot on this property today that's lost, please, dear Lord, help them to get saved today. Those who should get baptized for you, help them to make that important decision as well. But by all means, Lord, speak to all of our hearts. Help us to be tenderhearted to the leading of the Spirit of God and help us to make whatever decisions you want us to make. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning as we discuss the topic of revival. There's all different things about revival that we think that it is. Obviously, revival does involve lost people getting saved. And praise the Lord for those who get saved during a time of revival. However, most of the time, when God gives revival in our lives or in our churches or in our country, most of the time, revival involves God's people getting right with him and getting their hearts right, getting their lives right, living right, all of that. Most of the time, revival, again, is intended for God's people. 
It's really not intended for the world and the lost people getting saved. Now, obviously, obviously, when revival comes, that's, that happens. Lost people do get saved. But the revival that we need is often not what people think that it is. What is it that we are looking for when we want to see revival? What are the results of a heaven-sent revival? It's four things, and we're going to go over that right now. First of all, look at Acts chapter 10. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter number 10, and we're going to read one verse. Verse number 38. Y'all glad to be here this morning? Are y'all awake? Nope, you're not awake. Are we sleeping? We are in your dream. That's what it is. We're all there with you. And uh, we'll see if we can mess up your dream. And uh, I, I don't like, you know, at age 52, I don't dream every night. But when I do dream, they're weird. I mean, they're just like weird and uh, I'm getting to the point where I don't like dreaming anymore. <laughs> I'd rather just sleep and not dream. Just let my body get some rest. <laughs> so it's just, but they're, they're weird. I don't know what it is. Maybe, maybe um, I had some bad pizza the night before or something. I don't know. But, oh, that's right. Brother, brother uh, Albert, your dad gave us a whole bunch of pizza last night. That's why I had a weird dream. All right. But anyway, Acts chapter 10. Are you there? All right. Look at verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. All right. <clears throat> the first part of revival, write this down if you're taking notes, is this. Revival of doing good, not just stopping bad. Revival of doing good, not just stopping bad. So, we look at our country, and we see all the bad that's going on in our country. I'm sorry for all those that want to, but can't blame Trump anymore. I mean, that's over. It's history. <laughs> but so many people look at our country the last four years uh, and say, oh, look how bad the country is. It's all Trump's fault. Well, we have Biden now, and uh, so you can't blame Trump. But I suppose they can try. That for four years, they'll say, well, look what I inherited. But anyway, uh, what I look at in our country is I look at the abortions. I look at the rioting. I look at the division. I look at our public school systems, and I see all that um, they teach, you know? I mean, uh, the LGBTQ um, is, look, look, look. H here's my, my complete, honest, and, and real um, thinking on that. What anybody does in their own bedroom is their business. I mean, honestly, they'll have to stand before God if they do what God calls an abomination. But what they do in their own bedroom, I, I don't think the government should legislate anything about people's bedrooms. Whatever they do is their business. However, when they start teaching it in the public schools, where they want special laws, and, and where they want people to endorse it and accept it and promote it, that's where it crosses the line. And so right now in the public school system, starting at kindergarten, they are teaching the LGBTQ plus agenda to all of our kindergartner kids and all the way through, uh, obviously, up to 12th grade. And I think that's wicked. It's ungodly. It's not right. We're, they're, they're teaching that, but we can't say anything about Jesus or the Word of God in, in, in the public schools. I mean, it's just ludicrous what's going on. So, But when you see all the evil in Hollywood, when you see the Internet pornography industry, the multi-billion dollar industry, when you see the corruption that's in our uh, politics and, and how politicians are abusing their office and their power and you know they're not really looking out for the best interest of our of our country then you kind of look at seeing how communism and socialism is now a primary agenda when it comes to um when it comes to our politics. And it's, it's just not the same way that it has been ever since our country has founded. Things are going in a different direction. Then you look at the atrocities that have happened in Afghanistan. I, I don't know, you know, 
that kind of thing really makes me mad. I mean, it, 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 it makes my blood boil. Our, our, yeah, you know, all these you know, people that are, I don't know, they're, they're, well, Biden's better than Trump, so that's all there is to it. No, I'm sorry. 13 Marines died. Did you hear that? 13 Marines died just a couple of days ago as a direct result of the policy of the administration of our president. 13 Marines died. Man, that makes me mad. I don't, I don't understand how we can just look back at Afghanistan and, and then, okay, I've seen videos about how the Taliban has taken over Afghanistan and they are executing Christians. I saw this one video of about a dozen men just lined up in a row um, and, and hand, uh, uh, hands tied behind their back and they had men with machine guns just one at a time just wasted them. Blew them, blew them away, and, and they fell down, and they were dead. And then they took about probably 30 seconds, and they were just shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting just to get as many bullets in their bodies as they possibly can. And what was their crime? They were Christians. That was their crime. And the Taliban doesn't like Christians or Christianity. And so I see the atrocities that's going on in the world. And yes, all the bad needs to stop. But revival that we need is not just the absence of the bad. It's also the presence of the good. So if we're going to stop the bad, what are we going to do in place of it? Well, the Bible tells us about Jesus. It says about his whole life. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, a summary of the life of Jesus. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. To what end? Here's the end. Who went about doing good? That's the summary of the life of Jesus as he lived it on this earth. He was anointed of God. He was filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. And what did he do with it? He went around, went about doing good. It doesn't say about the life of Jesus that he performed miracles. It doesn't say about the life of Jesus that he preached wonderful sermons. When God in the scripture decided to give us a summary of the life of his son after he had lived and died and rose again from the dead, after he fulfilled the purpose of coming to earth to die and be our substitute and pay for our sins, the Holy Ghost of God, the scriptures was given a summary of the life of Jesus, and it just says he went about doing good. Everywhere he went, he just did good. What is the revival that we need? We need a revival of doing good. What does that mean? That means to be like Jesus. Basically, to treat others like the Savior did. Let me ask you a question about your life. If others observed you at work, if others observed you in your neighborhood, if others from church observed your devotion to God, would they come up with the conclusion that you're a person that just everywhere you go, you just do good to people? Well, that's what we need. That's what we need. How many times have I told people, you know, I go soul winning every day. And oftentimes I'll ask them, I want to pray for you. What can I pray for you about? And they say, peace in the world. Peace in the world. And you know what I respond with? I say, man, there's a lot of ugly in this world right now, isn't there? There's a lot of bad. And I say, and I say this often. You know, this world needs more love. And it really does. It needs us to love each other more. It needs us to just want to do good. Oh, I'm going to step on some toes right now. I really am. But, but, but we need to think about it. When you drive, do people look at you and think of you as a good driver? And I don't mean by driving within the lines. I don't mean by driving the law, you know, keeping the speed limit, things like that. I mean, do people typically look at you? Do you allow people to go in, in, in front of you? When you go to um, a parking lot to go to the store, if someone wants to get the same parking spot that you want, do you hurry up and get in there before them? Or do you prefer them and allow them to go? 
I mean, how is it that we are when it comes to our attitude and our behavior and how we treat each other? Do we live our lives just going about doing good? Just doing good to everybody. That's the revival that we need. I wrote this down. It's not enough just to stop the doing of bad and the doing of evil. We need to replace it with the doing of good. Look over at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter number 5. Let me give you an example. Galatians chapter number 5. And I'd like you to look down at verse number 22. All right, Galatians chapter 5. Before verse number 22, maybe you could look at verse number 19. Let's just start in verse number 19. Let's just do that. Now watch this carefully. In verse number 19 of Galatians 5, the Bible says this. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. So you know what that is? That's a description of bad. That's a description of evil. The works of the flesh. So if you go down to verse 22, it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. So what we see here is we, we see the extremes. We see the works of the flesh, which is all this bad and all this evil. And then we see the fruit of the Spirit, which is all this good. Now, what does God say? Here's what he says. Stop doing the bad and start doing the good. So revival is not when we just stop doing the bad and that's it. No, it's no longer doing the bad and instead we're doing the good. I remember when I was a teenager, I mentioned this <coughs> last night, I used to listen to some pretty bad rock groups. ACDC was one of my favorite groups. And, you know, I was a rebellious teenager. You know, I, I remember there was a song by uh, Phil Collins back in the day, in the 1980s, where I think the title, or I don't know what the title was, but it was, I don't care no more what you say. And uh, I used to get so mad at my mom, and I would go in my car, and I'd listen to that song, and it would feed my rebellion. I would be like, I don't care what you say, mom, you know, and I used to listen to that kind of music. Well, when God started convicting my heart about not listening to the world's music, I walked down the aisle and I gave up the world's music. But I said, Christian music is kind of corny. Oh, man, I don't... I, here's what I'll do. I'm just not going to listen to any music. So I gave up the bad music, and I said, I'm not going to listen to any music. Well, that lasted about two weeks. After about two weeks, I started listening to the bad music again. It, it just didn't work. So a couple of months passed, a few months passed, and I dedicated my life to God to become a preacher. And so this time, I said, okay, I'm going to, once again, I'm going to give up the world's music, but now I'm going to replace it and start listening to Christian music. And you know what? That worked. I have never gone back. That was when I was 17 years of age. I gave up the world's music, and I have never looked back. So what do I do now? I just listen to Christian music all the time. I don't understand Christians who believe in God and want to live for God and listen to the devil's music. And I just, I just don't understand that. And, and by the way, in case you're wondering, is ACDC the devil's music? Of course it is. 
the songs that were titled Hell's Bells, Highway to Hell, Dirty Deeds, Done Dirt Cheap, all that stuff, that's not godly. That's not honoring to the Lord. That's honoring the devil and uh, his agenda. And yes, that's bad music. And so there's so much about the world's music that's carnal or fleshly or just flat out wicked. And the fact of the matter is, God says revival is not just when you stop doing the bad, but when you start doing the good. And so ever since I was 17, now I'm 52, I have given up the world's music. I have no desire to listen to ACDC. I have no desire to listen to Phil Collins. I have no desire to listen to the music that I used to feed my flesh with. And now I love Christian music that feeds my spirit. That's what I love. And that's the revival that we need. So we see here in Galatians 5, God talks about the works of the flesh. And then he says, the fruit of the spirit. So he says, stop doing the works of the flesh and engage in the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, long-suffering, temperance. Against such there is no law. And God says, engage in that behavior. So let me ask you a question. Do you live in the fruit of the Spirit? Is that a description of your life? Well, that's the revival that we need. We need to just be good to everybody. Every once in a while, people, they get mad at preachers. They get mad at churches because they feel that All church says and all a preacher says is stop doing this and stop doing this and laws and rules. No, that's half of it. The real blessing of the Christian life is the doing of good. You know, a lot of times people, they may not like our position, you know, where we stand. But they should like our disposition, how we treat each other. You know, there's, I, for the first time in uh, all the years that I've been preaching now, there's some uh, Facebook pages and um, Facebook uh, podcasts or whatever that uh, they go around and they, they, they get clips from people's sermons, you know, what they don't like. And so I've, I've been targeted. Yay. <laughs> I, I've got two <laughs> clips now. And... Uh, there, there's a sermon that I, I preached against alcohol. And, and the biblical position is you should never drink alcohol under any circumstance. Alcohol is, 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 is the poison of the devil. It'll destroy lives. It's, it's amazing to me how people think you can drink alcohol as long as you don't get drunk. That's like saying you, you can, if you're married, you can hold someone else's hands. You can put your arm around them. You can go on dates with them as long as you don't commit adultery. <laughs> I mean, yeah. What? <laughs> if you're married and you have a spouse and your spouse says, oh yeah, I, I'm dating this girl, but it's okay, we're not committing adultery. As long as we don't commit adultery, it's okay. You'd be like, what in the world? <laughs> you know, so I mean like drunkenness clearly is wrong, but the path that leads to drunkenness is also wrong. And so anyway, that's my biblical position. And so they decided to take a clip out of that, you know. And they try to make fun of me because because I talked about that. Go for it, man. Make fun of my position all you want. But but what I don't want is for them to think I'm a bad, unkind, hate-filled, mean person. I don't I I I don't want to be that way. I want to have love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness. I want to be long suffering with people. I want to have the fruit of the Spirit. So that's okay if they don't like my position. But the fact is, I sure hope they don't have anything to say against my disposition. You know, everybody who walks through the doors, and by the way, if you're sitting here this morning and you think alcohol's okay, well, I think you're wrong. But I'm going to love you anyway. I don't want to hate you, I don't want you to feel like you're not welcome here. Or that, you know, you, you, you're a lesser of a Christian because you think alcohol is okay. And by the way, th- there's not one verse in the Bible that you can honestly hang your hat on and justify drinking Budweiser. I mean, there's just not one. Michelob. 
you know, there's Jack Daniels. I mean, you cannot, you know, every once in a while people say, <laughs> Jesus turned water into wine. Uh, they're showing their, their ignorance when they say things like that. The word wine in the Bible, <clears throat> by definition, is just fruit of the vine. That's all it is, fruit of the vine. Now, in context, it's either fermented fruit of the vine or unfermented fruit of the vine. You can look at the context and determine if it's talking about alcohol or grape juice. I'm going to tell you this. Jesus, when he turned water into wine, they called it new wine, literally meaning it had not aged. It was freshly squeezed. If you know anything about alcohol, in order for it to become alcohol, it has to age. It has to ferment. When grapes are freshly squeezed, my friend, that is grape juice. And that's always what God referred to in the Bible when it, when it said new wine. It wasn't new like you just opened the bottle for the first time. It was new because it was freshly squeezed. That's what it was referring to. But anyway, the fact of the matter is we don't just need a revival of stopping bad. We need a revival of doing good. Number two, look at Mark chapter 16. Y'all still with me this morning? <coughs> Mark chapter 16. Look down at verse number 15. Mark chapter 16 and verse number 15. It says this, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. All right, what do we need to, what, what is a heaven sent revival? What does it look like? Number one, it's a revival of doing good, not just stopping bad. Number two, it is a revival of saturation, not isolation. It is a revival of saturation, not isolation. All right. In the Bible, God is very clear. In 1 John chapter 2, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And then it says, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So there's an aspect of the world that God says we should isolate ourselves from. In other words, don't let the world in your home. Don't let the world be what you follow, what you mimic, what you look to as an example. The Bible says the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh is not of the Father, but is of the world, and it will pass away. So God says, isolate yourself from that. But that's not the complete sense of revival in our relationship to the world because it says in mark 16 15 go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature so what is real revival real revival is not just keeping yourself from the world and acting like the world real revival or biblical revival or heaven sent revival is when we saturate the world when we go into all the world and preach the gospel to every Christian or to every creature. Don't just keep the world out of your life. That's not all that revival is. Revival is going into all the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to this statement. Everybody in our community should hear the gospel. Everybody. And by the way, it's not just Pastor Sulian's job. Do you know how many people live in the city of Longmont? Approximately 100,000 people. Approximately. Do you know how many people live in Boulder County? Well over 300,000. I think it's closer to 450,000. Somewhere around there. People live in our county. Now watch this carefully. Do you think I can talk to every one of them by myself? I can't. I talk to everybody that I can, but I can't talk to every person in Longmont. 
I can't talk to every person in Boulder County. I happen to live in Weld County. I live in Firestone. There's, I think, 13,000 people that live in the city of Firestone. And then in Weld County, now Weld County goes a long way, so there's part of Weld County that's kind of out of our reach, but the portion of Weld County that I live in and near us, I don't know, maybe there's 80, 90, 100,000 people. So there's maybe a half a million people that are in those two counties that are within our reach. You know what God says? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I can't do it alone. It's not just a command for the preacher. God's great commission is for every Christian. We should saturate our county, our community with the gospel. Everywhere you go, you ought to pass out gospel tracts. We have our gospel track rack right there on the back table, right there by the door, so that every time you come to church, you can get a handful of tracts, and then you just hand them out. You give them to everybody that you can. When you go through a drive through when you go shopping, uh, when, you're, uh, when you just meet people, when you come across their path, you, can I give you one of these? Have you ever gotten one of these before? This is an invitation to our church, and also there's some Bible verses on the inside that might encourage you. I'd like to share this with you. I mean, just that at all. And then there's some times where you can actually go soul winning, where you talk to people and ask them, do they know for sure when they die they'll go to heaven? Has anybody ever showed you from the Bible the verses where it explains how you can know for sure that you'll go to heaven. Listen us carefully. Listen us carefully. How many people did Jesus die for when he died on the cross? Everybody. Everybody. Don't you think Jesus wants everybody saved? Well, how are they going to know? How are they going to get saved? How are they going to hear the gospel? They're going to hear it through us. You know, sometimes people, you know, we have this misinformed theology about predestinationism and some preachers get up and they say god has predestined people to go to heaven and he's predestined others to go to hell you know why they teach that doctrine it's not in the bible the reason they teach it is because they don't want to go soul winning they don't want the responsibility of sharing the gospel they say it's already predetermined Everybody on this planet, God chose who's going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell. It's all predetermined. That's a bunch of garbage. It's not predetermined. There's nothing in the Bible that indicates that God predestines people to go to heaven and predestines others to go to hell. Here's what the Bible does say. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God says, whosoever will may come the bible says in first john that jesus died for the sins of the world the bible tells us in first i think it's first or second timothy who will have all men to be saved it is first timothy chapter two god says he will have all men to be saved so how's he going to do it now this is a second a second incorrect philosophy god is not going to come down and just talk to these people and win them to himself. He could if he wanted to, but he's not doing it. So therefore, God said, if you're saved, I want you to carry the gospel to the world. That's the way God set it up. It's your job and my job. It's all of our jobs. We're supposed to saturate this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What does God, do I have to be responsible to helping people get saved? According to the Bible, the answer is yes. Now, God could save anybody without our help, but he won't. He wants our help. In Romans chapter 10, in verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then it says, How shall they call on him in whom they have not heard, or in whom they have not believed? And it says, How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And that word preacher doesn't mean pastor. The word preacher literally means one who proclaims the word of God. That's all it means. 
So then it says, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So what God says is this. People need to call upon the name of the Lord if they're going to go to heaven. And it literally says in the next verse, how are they going to call on him if they don't believe in him? And how are they going to believe in him if they don't hear? And how are they going to hear unless somebody tells them? That's basically what God says. So what's the revival we need? Not just stay away from the bad influence of the world, but let's go into the world and saturate it with the gospel. Number three, look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And look down at verse number 14. 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse number 14. 1 Peter chapter 1, are you there? All right, look at verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. What's the revival that we need? Number one, the revival of doing good not just stopping bad. Number two, the revival of saturation, not just isolation. Number three, the revival of personal purity, not political posturing. I said the revival of personal purity, not political posturing. What does political posturing mean? Okay, here's what this means. Here's what this means. When you come to church and you look the part, you're dressed right, you came to church, you had a Bible under your arm, you got your hair right, you're acting right, and you're looking right. And that's what you do at church. But then when you go home, or when you're by yourself, you're a different person. So what is political posturing? It's when you look right on the outside, but on the inside, you're not right. So you know what God says? Be holy, for I am holy. So what's the revival that we need? We need a revival of personal purity. Let me ask you a question. What are you on the inside? Are you pure? Are you holy? Or are you just simply filled with lust, filled with sensual desires, filled with covetousness of things and money? And that's you on the inside. Well, if that's that's the case, your political posturing will only keep you in the game for so long. Eventually, what's on the inside is going to come out. Eventually, what's on the inside is going to affect the outside. And so God says, I don't want you just to come to church and dress right and look right and act right and behave right, and then the other 167 hours of the week, other than this one hour, You're a totally different person. No, God says, I want a revival of personal purity. Personal purity. Let me give you an example. What do you look at on the internet? If Jesus was standing right behind your shoulder while you're on the internet, would you be embarrassed? If your preacher happened to walk by your office or house and you're on the internet and I just said, hey brother so and so how's it going would you be like would you like click click, get out of here you know out of that screen or whatever would you be embarrassed if then God does this but if God was in your thoughts honestly he is would you be embarrassed about him knowing what you think about 
if God saw the condition of your heart, and he does, what you love, what you crave, what you desire, is it pure or is it ungodly? What kind of revival do we need? We need old-fashioned personal purity. What I have observed, and I got to tell you this, it makes me mad. I don't know if it's just something new or if it's been this way for a long time and we just didn't have social media to tell us about it. I don't know yet. I, I haven't investigated it, haven't studied it. I do know there's nothing new under the sun, so there's a possibility that it's been around for a while. But what I have seen in, in recent years is an onslaught of preachers and church leaders who commit horrible, sinful acts. I'm talking about fornication. I'm talking about adultery. I'm talking about abusing minors. You know, many of us have heard in the past about, you know, priests who have abused the altar boys and, you know, things like that. But it's not just confined, confined to that religion. It's in, it's in our, our churches. You know, churches that preach the Bible, that preach salvation, that go so many. And, and I'm, I'm appalled at the preachers and then staff members and then leaders who don't have personal purity. It is wrong. I came from a church. I came from a Bible college. Who, whose pastor, after I left, not while I was there, but after I left, a pastor was in his 50s. I think he was 54. And he sexually abused a 15-year-old girl in his church. And to this day, my mind is blown. It's like, what in the world? I mean, he had the premier church in America, as far as independent Baptist churches, 15,000 membership, um, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people getting saved and baptized every year, missions across the world. And here's this pastor, again, I think he was 54 years of age, and he sexually abused a 15-year-old young person in his church. He's been in jail since 2012. He's not, he's not supposed to have a release until 2024. But, but the point is this. Why is this happening? Why do we have, and by the way, it's not just isolated with that one church. I mean, it's, it's constant. It's constant. I've, I've heard of many uh, across America youth pastors that abuse their, their teenagers in their youth group. And, it, and it's just like, really? It's like, we, what, what, we look the part, we have the suit and tie, we got the short haircut, we have the word of God, we preach the truth, but inside, we are not pure. We are ungodly. We're filled with lust. We're filled with covetousness. We are filled with unholy desires. You know what God says our revival needs to be? It needs to be personal purity it needs to be be ye holy for i am holy it needs to be don't just look the part but also act the part i cannot tell you i cannot tell you the hundreds of thousands and even millions of people who have been hurt because they've gone to a church where someone in leadership was a hypocrite. Where a pastor, uh, you know, committed adultery, where a youth pastor abused a minor, where something was wrong. And now these people are like, I am never going to go to church again. I am never going to go to church again. You know what? I don't blame them. I don't judge them. I don't look at them and say, what's wrong with you? Why in the world are you acting that way? Because they've been hurt. And when people get hurt deeply enough, it affects them in a negative way. 
Shame on any church leader who doesn't act the part and just looks the part. You know, the safest place in the world for every person to ever be ought to be church. It ought to be that you come here and you never even think that anybody's going to harm you. That you come here and it ought to be just love, kindness, gentleness, and preaching of the truth. Shame on people who aren't that way. Now, wait a second. I'm not just talking about church leaders, but what about parents who tell their children to be good Christians and then they themselves are not? What about, you know, all throughout all of us now, we need a revival of personal purity. Number four and last, look back at uh, 1 John chapter 4, our text verse, our passage. Look down at verse number 17. <coughs> we'll be done in just a couple of minutes. 1 John chapter 4, and look at verse 17. You ready? 1 John chapter 4, in verse 17, it says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. Now, look at verse 18. There is no what? Fear in love. But perfect love, that word perfect, does not mean sinless. It means complete. Complete love or perfect love casteth out what? Fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Do you know what we need a revival of, number four? We need a revival of love, not fear. Love, not fear. What I often tell people is this. When you live your life living a good life, hoping that God will let you go to heaven and not let you go to hell, you're living your life with the motivation of fear. Once a person comes to Christ and says, Jesus, would you please save me from going to hell and give me a home in heaven? He saves you. You'll never go to hell. You'll never, ever, ever have to worry about going to hell. So why do you do good now? Why do you go to church? Why do you tithe? Why do you do the things you do? It ought to be because you're motivated by love, not by fear. Do you know why I go to church? Because I love God. Do you know why I tithe and give offerings? Not because I have to. Because I love God. Do you know why I go soul winning? Because I deeply love people. And I don't want anybody to go to hell. Everything I do right now when it comes to my Christian life, I do it because of the motivation of love. Because I love God and because I love people. And that's the revival that we need. We don't need a revival of, you better fear. If you don't live for God, you're going to be cursed. If you don't do what God wants, you're going to be punished. Well, that's okay to a point. That's like, that's like grade school level Christianity. That's what that is. No, I don't want to be punished. No, I don't want to be cursed. Of course not. But that's not the end game. The end game is I want to do everything I do because I love God and I love people. Do you know what the Bible says? When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment of all? He responded and said, here's what it is. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he said the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said this. All of the law, all of it is fulfilled in those two commands. You know what he basically said? He said you would obey all of the law, all of it, if you just love God and love your neighbor. That's it. If you loved. And that's the revival we need. We need a revival of love, not of fear. We need to have sincere love, 
for God and for people. And by the way, we need to love all peoples, all races, all classes, everybody. Don't just love the lovely, love the unlovely. Don't just love those who will benefit you, love those who will not benefit you. Don't just love those who are easy to love. <laughs> love those who are hard to love. That's the revival we need. That's the result of a heaven-sent revival is when we love God sincerely and then when we love everybody, not just those that, are, that we like, not just those that are nice, not just those that will benefit us, but when we love everybody. What's the revival that we need? We need a revival of doing good, not just stopping bad. We need a revival of saturation, not isolation. We need a revival of personal purity, not political posturing. And then we need a revival of love, not fear. I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with this. Point number four, <clears throat> you know what it says? It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? So do you know what the word beginning means? That means it's not the end. <laughs> it's the beginning. So do you need to fear the Lord? Yes, you do. That's the beginning of wisdom. But as you grow in the Lord, now it turns into love. Everything you do is because you sincerely love God. But you'll never get to that point unless you first fear the Lord. That's the beginning. So when God says, I want to give you revival, it's not just, hey, everybody, start fearing God. Well, yeah, that's part of it. But the revival we need is, hey, everybody, start loving God sincerely with all of your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for being a wonderful God and what a joy it is to be here. Thank you for every person that took time to come to church. Thank you for those who are watching online. And I just pray you bless every single one of us, Lord. Thank you for being our God. Lord, we need revival. Would you please, 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 please help us to have a heaven-sent revival. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Let me ask you a quick question. Did God speak to your heart this morning about the revival we need? Did he? If he did speak to you and you'd like me to pray for you about it, would you raise your hand? Preacher, God spoke to me. He spoke to me. Father, you see the hands that are raised. I don't know how you spoke to them individually. They're just acknowledging that you did speak to them. Would you please help them? Help us all to have this heaven-sent revival, the revival we need. And we'll give you all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand? The pianist will begin to play. If God spoke to your heart, 